Excellent. Welcome back to Undergraduate Seminar, everyone. We are glad to have Jiawei Chen and Ran Li to present on their work with Lisa Jeffrey about rapid testing in the COVID and modified SIR model. Very, very relevant work. I'm super duper excited to hear what they have to say today. Take it away, folks. Thank you. And thank you everyone for showing up today. So as the title suggests, today's talk will be about modified SIR model and how we can, we can uh, model rapid testing in COVID. Uh, today's talk will be given by me and Ran. Jinru will, uh, Jinru is not here due to, uh, due to jet lag. Um, this research project is sub, um, supported by the UFT work study and supervised by Professor Lisa Jeffrey. Let's get started. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Yuan Li and I am currently a fourth year student uh, studying mathematics and specialist in theoretical statistics. And uh, so uh, I will start by introducing you about the, sorry, the information of rapid test. So rapid test is a newly developed kind of uh, approach to test COVID, the coronavirus. So let's compare with the traditional PCR test with rapid test. So PCR is short for polymerase chain reaction. So for PCR test, actually the testers are, the test target is our RNA, which is the genetic material of the coronavirus. However, rapid test is quite different. We do not test the genetic material. Instead, we test the antigen, which is the protein fragment specific to the coronavirus. Or some of the rapid tests also test for antibody. And the most different thing between uh, PCR and rapid test is that PCR test generally takes 24 hours to get results. However, rapid test only need uh, 50 minutes to obtain the results that we need. So uh, in this study, we're quite interested in if the how the popularization of um, rapid test will influence the dynamics of the pandemic. And in our research, we're trying to answer this question quantitatively by building a model with parameters which are able to characterize the effect of rapid test. Okay, and Jiawei Chen will start it from introducing you guys the most uh, um, commonly used or the simplest model in pandemic uh, modeling. So I will talk about SIR model. So SIR model are uh, the letters are short for susceptible, infected, and removed. Um, this is a sometimes known as the compartmental model because they uh, it divides the population into three different compartments. So uh, for for the S compartments, it's supposed to contain individuals who are not immune to the disease and are. Uh, and are not infected yet. For, for the uh, eye compartment, it contains individuals of the population who have been infected and are infectious um, to those who haven't come into contact with the disease. And the R compartment is assumed to be the, uh, the population who, who have been infected and uh, recovered and gained immunity to the disease. Um, so here um, below the slide, there's a, there's a small graph illustrating how, uh, how, the, how, populations, uh, how population flows from one compartment to, the, to other uh, compartments. So if we look at the differential equations in the next slide, we have uh, there's three differential equations characterizing the, the flow between the compartments. So, uh, so the beta, beta here denotes the, the likelihood of transmission. So we can see that uh, this will be the first arrow between S and I. This represents uh, when this represents population who are uh, used to be susceptible and be became infected later. 
And in the in the first equation, we can see that uh, there's a negative uh, ds dt equals to negative beta si over n. So uh, this represents an outflow from the s category, and uh, this flow is proportional to both s and i. As we uh, would expect, uh, the increase of s or i will will uh, increase the likelihood of um, contacts between between this um, infected and uninfected individuals. So this is where uh, why we have s times i, and it's over over n. So this is basically n means the total population size here it serves as a normalization constant. And uh, beta is the likelihood constant. Mm -hmm. For the second equation, uh, this will be the, we have the same term again, but positive because it's flowing into, into the I component and, and the negative gamma I. Here, gamma stands for the, stands for the recovery rate of inc infectious individuals. So say for example, if it takes seven days uh, on average for, for those who are infected to recover, then it would be uh, one over seven uh, per day per individual in, uh, to, to be the gamma constant. So for the third equation, it's just the same term again, but flowing to, flow to the recovered population. So, in the next slide, uh, we have a graph of a typ typical SIR model as it progresses through time. Here we have uh, an equals to a thousand. And, uh, and we can see that the orange line is the, is the infected. And that's usually what we care about. And uh, here, it peaks at one point and then it slowly goes down. And uh, the blue line will be uh, the susceptible po population. In, in this particular simulation, uh, everyone in the population gets infected at one point of time and uh, uh, transfer into I and slowly recover uh, uh, as the green line, which is R goes up. Sorry, I have some difficulty flipping the pages. So there are some advantages of SIR. First, it's simple, and we can easily get an analytical solution by separating the variables. So if we're just looking, if we are just looking at the first two equations of the ODE system of uh, yes here. So so the last the we can ignore the last equation for now because it actually. Uh, does not interact with with S and R, so so the information is already carried in the second equation uh, in terms of the interaction between I and R compartment. So if we are just looking at the first two equations, this is actually a uh, this is actually a special case of predator prey model. So predator prey model. Uh, is a classic model to, that characterizes the, uh, um, the the dynamics of a populate uh, predator population and the prey population. As predators increase, uh, the prey will decrease, and the predators will decrease in uh, in response to the decrease of food. Here we have um, we have something similar to that, but um, can we go back to the next slide? Yes. So here we can uh, compute the solution by by dividing the two uh, by by dividing the second equations with the first equation to get di over ds, and if we simplify, we get this negative one plus gamma over beta s. So if we uh, move the, the ds to the right hand side and create and uh, integrate both sides. We get i on the left side and uh, 
negative s. So so this is integrating the one, and uh, for for the gamma over beta, that that's just a constant which comes out uh, out of the integral, and the one over s just gets integrated into log s, and we have a integration constant in the end. So here are some more steps. So uh, if we move all the variables to the left-hand side and only leave the constant on the right-hand side, we can, uh, we can actually write this in terms of the initial condition. So I0 and S0 denotes the initial uh, infected and the initial susceptible population. And uh, uh, recall, recall from last page that DI, dr over ds equals to negative one plus this uh, constant times one over s. So if we set s equal to uh, gamma over beta, then we then we can uh, set this derivative to zero. This will suggest that uh, when i is considered as a function of s and the s equal to this, uh, is set to gamma over beta, then I will have a critical point. Uh, and uh, this will, uh, referring to the, the graph uh, in two last slides before, and we can see that this will be the peak of uh, the orange line. In this particular case, uh, well, in case of our model, both beta and the uh, and the gamma are positive, so we get a nice maximum as the as the um, I curve. So this will be the advantages, the advantage of the SIR model, which is that we can easily get an analytical solution. So, but but here are some limitations of the SIR model. One of the limitations is that. Uh, does not account for the increase and decrease of the population. So there's no vital dynamics. So uh, namely there's, we, we didn't account for the death or birth of individuals. So uh, this will work best when the disease has a low fatality rate. So say for example, flu, maybe something that spreads, but does not really, does not really kill people. However, in the case of COVID, the, uh, this rate is actually significant. And a second, a second limitation is that uh, for COVID, there's a latency period. And the, for the purpose of this project, we are, uh, we are modeling rapid testing. And uh, when, when we are modeling, uh, so the purpose of rapid testing is to identify individuals who, who are already infected but haven't shown symptoms yet. So, uh, so latency period here means that uh, uh, the period between uh, when individuals get infected but uh, haven't become infectious yet. So, so they don't show any symptoms, not infectious yet, but already, uh, already infected. So the purpose of rapid testing will be to identify those individuals and those who are who already show symptoms as well before they, uh, before they infect others. So introducing SEIR model, E here stands for exposed. So uh, here we divided the previous I com compartment into two different compartments. Here uh, we, even though we still use uh, letter I, but, but this actually stands for a slightly different meaning because uh, here I stands for both infected and infectious. So it has to be, um, uh, so E here is also infected, but they are not infectious yet. They are just exposed to the disease and haven't shown any symptoms yet. So uh, here in the, in the, in the flow, in the flow chart, we can see that uh, the, the arrow from S to I pre uh, previously is now connected to E. So the beta I over N term is connected to E instead. And there's a new arrow between E and I. This will be the uh, progression from exposed to infectious to, well, uh, 
So if it, for example, takes seven days, then it would be one over seven per individual per day. So this slowly transform into slowly transform into infectious individuals. And again, uh, sorry, there's a, yes, there's a question in the chat. No infectious means no symptom. Uh, uh, I cannot say that for sure, but uh, I think um, I think that there maybe is not a solid connection between symptoms and infectious or not, because oh, there are a lot clear. of people who are infectious but still have symptoms. But what we okay. want to say is that they are infected, but they are not able to infect others. That has the meaning of E. Okay, there's a, another question in the chat. Not clear the difference between E and I destroying sets. Uh, yes, uh, so, so E and I together Mix up the, the original I in the SIR. So here E is just uh, not infectious yet. That's the most important part. Uh, they may or may not have symptoms. Yes, thank you for the correction. So uh, here we, uh, they may, not, uh, may or may not have symptoms, but what, what, uh, what we actually care about is whether they're infectious or not. So, uh, if you're uh, looking at the equations here, the, uh, the first line, um, so ds dt equals to, oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce the, some other letters. So, so this is the uh, birth rate or perhaps inflow from other communities to, to this community, the inflow of population. So as I mentioned earlier, the original SIR model does not account for vital dynamics. So here we, we are looking at, uh, we are accounting for the inflow of population and the, and the uh, per, per capita natural uh, death rate, which is, uh, which is mu in this, in this uh, model. So from each square, we can see that there's a arrow pointing out labeled mu. That, that means the per capita natural death rate. And uh, from, from the I compartment, there's an additional, additional uh, alpha arrow pointing out. That, that means the virus in those fatality. And uh, here we're assuming the exposed uh, individuals. So assuming that they are not in the later stage of the disease, they, uh, they do not suffer from a significant, significant chance of virus-induced uh, fertility. And uh, lastly, we have I pointing out to R. So that's the same as uh, what we had previously. That's the recovery. Uh, again, we are assuming that um, patients in earlier stage, that means in the E compartment, does not skip the I phase and directly go into the R compartment. So here we, we have uh, accounted for the, for the vital dynamics and the latency period, but uh, we need to incorporate the rapid test into the model as well. Okay, thank you so much for Jiawei's explanation about our model uh, background. So both SIR model and SEIR model are good models for uh, modeling dynamics of death, uh, sorry, dynamics of transmission of COVID-19 without the influence of rapid test. However, we need to consider the, how the rapid test can affect the dynamics. So in order to do that, we develop our new model, which is called SEIQR model. So um, instead of only having S, E, I, and R, we actually introduce a fourth, sorry, a fifth compartment, which is called Q. And this is abbreviated for uh, quarantine population. So our main idea is that because of the rapid test, those who are tested positive for rapid test uh, will self-isolate. So they're in Q section. And now we're going to see how the model is different from before before uh, the SEIR and the SIR model. 
So um, the first difference is that for SEIR model, um, the proportion from S to E is uh, connected by beta times I divided by N. So beta is the transmission rate, I is the infected and N is the total population. However, in the new SEIR model, uh, our denominator is changed into N minus Q. You can think why that is the case. This is because for those who are quarantined, they are not able to infect others or, or they are not able to be infected again. So uh, the denominator is changed into total population except for those in quarantine. Okay, so this is the first difference, the first modification that we make. And um, in addition, we also introduce two other parameters to characterize the effectiveness of rapid test. The first parameter that we introduce is called lambda. So lambda is the percentage of population that take rapid tests per day. And the second parameter is called eta, where eta is the sensitivity of test. So what is sensitivity? So sensitivity is actually a scientific word to, uh, for uh, medical science experiment, I think. So um, another word for sensitivity is something called the uh, true positive rate. So you can think of this as accuracy. Uh, so this is a um, number between zero and one. And the greater sensitivity is, the more accurate our test is. Okay, so um, based on these two parameters, uh, we define the third parameter, which is effectiveness. So this is the product of lambda and eta. So this effectiveness, which is the product of the previous two parameters, is uh, the overall influence of rapid test in our model. Okay, so now we are going to use these two parameters to show how uh, to determine how many people are flowed from E and I to Q. Uh, so this is the amount eta times lambda, the effectiveness that flowed from I and E to Q. Okay, so this is the first difference, that is second difference. And um, almost everything remains are the same from SEIR model. So the big lambda is for the uh, inf uh, population inflow and mu is the population outflow, or you can think of it as the nitro gas. And uh, epsilon is just uh, the reciprocal of the incubation period. And alpha is the death rate induced by COVID-19. And gamma is one over recovery rate. Uh, sorry, gamma is the recovery rate, which is one over the recovery period. And this mu is also uh, the uh, nitro death. Okay, so this is the overall idea about incorporating rapid test in our modeling. Uh, now let's take a look of our differential equations. Um, maybe it seems a little bit complicated at a first glance, uh, but actually it's uh, not too much different from SEIR model that I showed you before. Uh, this is the you no know, arrow from R to S. Oh, this is a very nice question. Uh, yeah, so yeah, there is some model called SEIRS model. I think there is something called it. So this model is for disease that are not. Um, so this is this is model for some kind of disease that people who are uh, who have already got it can get it again. But for COVID nineteen, um, most papers that we find does not uh, apply this. So we, it means that we omit the probability that people can get the uh, disease again. Uh, what is big lambda? Uh, big lambda is um, big lambda is population inflow. So it is kind of like nitro birth rate. It's, it's not exactly rate, but it's nitro birth. You can think of it that way. Okay, so I will continue. Uh, so like in our previous model, uh, 
yeah, the denominator here is n, which is the total population size. It is sum of the four compo uh, compartments, s plus e plus i plus r. Uh, however, in SCIQR, because I just explained that Q section people cannot uh, infect others. So uh, this uh, denominator is just the summation of S, E, and I, and R in, uh, without Q. All right, so this is the first difference that we just discussed before. And also, because of the introduction of rapid test, we also have eta times lambda. So for the second equation, um, the scalar before E is mu, which is the just uh, the natural death rate. We also have this one, eta times lambda, which is the effectiveness of rapid test. And similar as before, we have eta lambda here, eta lambda here. Okay, so this is just the, the mathematical language for our uh, flow chart. Okay, so as you can see that this model is quite complicated. There are a lot of parameters and four equations here. It is really hard to find an uh, analytical solution by hand. Uh, indeed, uh, not to mention SEIQR model, even SEI for SEIR model, it is very hard to find an analytical solution. Uh, therefore, in order to get, um, get some meaningful results, uh, we are going to do numerical analysis using Python. So here are the parameters and initial conditions that we choose. So for parameters, um, we choose the fertility rate induced by COVID alpha at 0.01. This is the estimated one. And the incubation rate period is five days. And natural birth is uh, 1,034 people per day. Natural dice is 775 per day. Transmission rate is 0 0.07. Okay, so these two numbers are on the natural births and natural dies before pandemic. Uh, we get this data from Statistics Canada. And uh, this is the data from actually 2019 before pandemic. Uh, someone asked, does the dot above SCIQR mean the time derivative for the updated values? Yes, yes, exactly. This is just ds over dt, time derivative. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to our initial conditions. Uh, for initial conditions, uh, S0, which is the, let's say S0 is short for, S0 is just S evaluated as time equals to zero. So it is the initial susceptible population. And I0 is the initial infected people. Uh, we set the initial infected people as 1,000. Initial quarantine is zero and initial uh, R at zero. Oh, I think that I forget to write down initial E is 1,000 as well. Sorry for that. Um, okay. So actually the sum of these three sections is the estimated total population of Canada. And then we're going to use these parameters and initial conditions to do numerical analysis. Here comes the results. So this is the, the, the ODE is solved numerically using, uh, using, using ODE int. This is a function from the SciPy uh, package in Python. Uh, okay, so here are the four graphs. Uh, these four graphs, the first one is the susceptible, the second one is exposed, infected, and quarantined. I just put all of, uh, actually there should be a fifth one, which is R, but that is not important, so I just omitted. Um, the most uh, meaningful two graphs to see is S and I, especially I. So for S, uh, you can see that um, we plot, um, we plot how the skeptical population change with time for different effectiveness of rapid test. And the black one, the black curve is for effectiveness equals to zero. So this is a completely no rapid test. So it means that there isn't completely no quarantine population, right? And for 
that uh, case, we can see that the skeptical population drops very quickly. So it means that more and more people get infected quickly. However, if we introduce rapid test, say here, effectiveness equals to 0 0.05, you can take a look at this blue curve. We find that the skeptical population beca becomes um, larger quickly, right? Uh, there is a huge difference from these two curves so that you can see how effectiveness of quarantine is or how effectiveness rapid test is. Uh, okay, similarly, uh, we, in, uh, we increased effectiveness. Uh, so we draw the red curve at 0 0.1 and green curve at 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 6, 8, and 1. Okay, so this is a uh, susceptible population. Uh, now let's look at the infective population. I think this one is more informative than the susceptible one. Um, and it is also more intuitive. So for the infective one, infected one, uh, as before, you can see that if there is no effectiveness as well, uh, at, at all, the infected population, the peak is really great, right? It's almost uh, between 1,200 and 1,400. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The question on the chat is that how I can get those curves if I cannot have analytical solution. Yeah, I use what I use is uh, the numerical analysis uh, package in Python. Um, yeah, so if you can, if you just uh, if you just uh, put zero to to uh, if you just put I, I think that in my simulation, I use almost 10,000 points between zero and 200. It's something like, I think, iteration, and then you will get this curve. I think, I think that is how we generate this curve. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, let's get back to this IT graph. So if effectiveness is zero, we can see the peak is really high. However, if we introduce the effective as 0 0.05, the peak gets, uh, gets uh, get down like this. And uh, more interestingly, you can find that um, at first, if I just increase effectiveness by 0 0.05, there is drastically difference between no effectiveness. However, uh, when, the, when the effectiveness becomes 0 0.2, even if I increase the effectiveness by 0 0.2, there is no significant difference between the two curves, right? Uh, because if you have a look at those curves um, are very close to each other. So we can see that uh, even though we increase the effectiveness by 0 0.2, there's not significant difference. Uh, so our um, next, next task is to find, um, we, find we know that a significantly increased effectiveness to one is not a very efficient thing to do. So can we find some uh, optimal uh, effectiveness that we can uh, obtain the same results as a large effectiveness? So we are going to find a minimum effectiveness. And how can we measure it is the minimum effectiveness? We use the maximum effective population, the peak to measure. So next thing that we do is that we draw a picture of the maximum effective number with respect to effectiveness. So uh, this is the maximum effective number and zero is the, its effectiveness. And this is the effective number, uh, sorry, this is the maximum effective number and 0 0.05 is its, its, its corresponding effectiveness. So by this idea, we draw this graph. And just as what we uh, just uh, assumed before, uh, we thought before, uh, this graph shows that when the effectiveness is 0 0.13, we get a very low maximum of infected number of if, uh, infected number. So this graph actually shows that effectiveness equals to 0 0.3 is enough. Okay. So the next thing is to say that how can we interpret the 0 0.13? Um, recall that we just defined effectiveness as the product of these two parameters, which is the percentage of population that take rapid tests per day 
and the sensitivity of test, right? So we can draw another graph, which is, uh, sorry. Uh, so, okay, so this is the definition for effectiveness. So if we do some rearrangement, then the minimum percentage of people population taking rapid test should be equal to 0 0.13 divided by the sensitivity of rapid test. And here is the graph. Uh, the horizontal axis represents for the sensitivity of our rapid test. And the vertical axis is actually, I, I think that I should change this word to proportion. It's the proportion, it's the proportion of infected population taking rapid test. And the product of this two quantity should be a constant, which is 0 0.1, 0 0.13. And this is the curve. I just uh, marked three points that I find really um, meaningful. And the first one is when we have perfect accurate rapid test, right? So that means that every people who are get uh, infected can be tested positive. If that is the case, then we only need 0.13% of people to take a rapid test. Uh, however, that is the most ideal scenario. That is not always the case. So if the sensitivity of rapid test gets uh, worse a little bit, becomes 90%. So it means for 100%, uh, so for example, if there are 100 people who are infected, the rapid test is able to tell you, uh, is able to um, have positive for 90 of them, then we need uh, more, a little more, a slightly more population to get co uh, rapid test. In this case, it is 14.4%. And another point that is meaningful is the green point. So for green point, the sensitivity becomes 50%. So what does 50% mean? It actually means that um, for people who are get who, who, who have who are infected, we can only test the accuracy is fifty percent. So if you just run, you just flip a coin, you can get fifty percent, right? So this is just random guess. And if that is the case, then we need um, zero point two six percent people to take rapid test. But actually, this is not uh, the case because if that if the rapid test have only fifty percent, why not just flip a coin? This is to decide if you have. COVID or not. Okay, so this is how we um, can interpret this 0 0.13. Okay, so uh, the above are uh, our model that we built. However, there are some limitations. The first one is that, as I just uh, mentioned before, it is really, really hard to find an analytical solution due to the existence of exposed period. There are a lot of uh, published paper about finding um, finding approximate solution or some modified SDR model so analytical solution. So it is not a really easy work to do as Jiawei showed how to find, compared to Jiawei showed how to find uh, the analytical solution of SIR model. And the second thing is that parameters are not always constant. For example, like as time goes on, the transmission rate beta may vary since more people are quarantined, right? And also because uh, the virus is changing all the time, so the transmission rate also changes. Uh, therefore, uh, we suggest that maybe we can rewrite our parameters as a function of time to get more accurate results. And the last thing is that there are too many parameters within our model. So it is hard to observe how each parameter may affect the dynamics of solution it is worth trying to simplify this model. Uh, okay, so I think that um, those uh, are all the results that I wanna show about our group project. So um, here are the re references. Um, if you have any question, uh, just free, feel free to ask. Hello. 
Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, it's uh, working. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, it's very enlightening. I wonder how, uh, if you did some sort of a reality check. I mean, how how uh, how 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 is your uh, model the 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 last model reflect? How well does your model reflect the reality? Um, in terms of reality check, uh, since this is a hypothetical. Uh, hypothetical situation when the when uh in which the rapid testing is popularized actually i think uh in, um it is uh we have a the university have a policy for those who are not vaccinated yet to uh do a rapid testing uh to to do a rapid test twice a week or something like that currently but uh i I'm afraid that we we don't have data for for the uh, for 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 model like this because rapid testing is not not that popular right yet. But um, it is true that we we can check that um, we can check the the other models that are not like the SEIR model that does not have rapid testing in it against the real data. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hey, yes, there. please. Uh, Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, quite interesting. Uh, congratulations for the work that you guys have done. I have a quick question more um, it's along the lines of what you were discussing about analytical solutions, but taken in a different direction, let's say. I, I'm more towards numerical methods and numerical solutions. So my question is, have you, have you played with the model and varying the parameters so that you, and it's kind of related to the reality check that someone was asking me for. Um, have you played with the model and changed the parameters so that you can see kind of uh, waves um, in the behavior of the infected people, for instance, in the compartment? Do you uh, know what I mean? Not quite sure whether I understand the so question. Usually, so... if you look at the plots, at, at the plots that we have reported from infected individuals, you see you see the waves, right? We are starting the fourth wave here in Toronto, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that you can look at the at the eye quantity that you have in your model. Now the SEER models, even the SAER model, uh, they lack the, the capability of reproducing these wave behaviors, right? You need to truncate your simulation or, or your numerical solution and restart again with your model so that you can pick up the new wave or things like that. There are some machine learning approach that try to merge these models. So I was wondering if you guys were interested, if you even thought about that. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Well, we haven't tried that yet, but that's an interesting direction to go in. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I think that means data is not time varying, right? Uh, uh, no, so, it's not. Right, 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 right. In, in this in this model, beta is 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 uh, fixed. That's why you don't have waves of uh, up and downs. Uh, but um, but uh, our our waves are because mainly um, changing uh, the re uh, uh, restriction regulations. Sometimes we, we open up, sometimes we close down, and that that, that changes the data every once in a while, and that will be uh, that would be the, the the main driver of the of getting a wave um, a wave of going up and down, right? Yes. Yeah, and and, uh, and that will be that will be very hard to model. Um, yeah, that's true. It's hard to model like well, how policy you know, or how people's well, mindset well, changes. Uh, well, uh, I suppose the computer just have to work harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, well, you, you can you can create some set of simple rules, right? When your eye level reaches a certain point, then you have the beta parameters that depends upon those levels, and you know, simplified versions of reality, if you wish. Yeah, well, maybe we can a, just 
Yeah, maybe we could uh, perhaps change the beta to a sine wave function or some other period. Some, uh, yeah, as you suggest, is something that depends on the, like when, when, when it reaches, a, when the population yeah. reaches a peak or a, or uh, falling down, you can change the like the uh, quarantine policies by by some small number. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. There's a, a question in the chat. How would this model change if using the PCR test instead of the rapid test? From Kevin Sanders. Sorry, let me look through the chat. Uh, yes, how would this model change if uh, using the PC, uh, PCR test inst uh, instead of rapid testing? So PCR tests are, uh, as we mentioned, uh, rather not so timely in terms of getting the results. So if we are use oh, here we are actually assuming that the uh, like the flow of people into quarantine category is continuous. Thus, uh, people are like doing rapid testing every day and uh, self-quarantine. But in the case of PCR, they, they will be like, uh, perhaps in, in, in real life, there will be like uh, some waves of getting the PCR test and then uh, for traveling purposes or perhaps working purposes. So instead of continuous transfer, it would be something like that happens uh, once in a while because it's not so timely. Does that answer the question? Okay, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Are there, are there more questions from the chat or uh, if you would like to unmute, they're welcome to ask live. Jesse said, uh, very impressed how you interpreted the effectiveness and uh, gave directions for the rate for rapid tests independent from... Thank you, thank you very much. Any other questions? Well, the reason I said is that, well, even though it sounds like, well, we are not sure how well you modeled i mean just on the other side i i was very impressed at how you actually uh, could give us some kind of directions like how little like percentage of the rapid test can give us some huge uh benefits and that was very impressive and you know it's just like showing us some kind of leadership right i mean it's, it's really nice thank you thank you so much thank you for attending this talk uh, so before people rush off, uh, uh, we want to thank our speakers, but we'd also like to ask you to uh, fill out a uh, brief questionnaire about how the talk went. We want to give feedback to these folks. This is very important feedback because this is a, a summer research project and we want to know how they did on their sort of final presentation. So let's take uh, three minutes, fill this out and uh, get some feedback to our speakers.
I'm, uh, I'm watching the feedback come in. It looks like you folks did very well on the presentation, uh, getting lots of fives out of five. That's excellent. Um, yeah, if everyone here could give some feedback, that'd be absolutely wonderful. I'm sure their supervisor would appreciate it very much. Ooh, a question has appeared in the chat. Noah oh. Argon. Thank you for asking a question. Uh, why is the minimum effectiveness necessary? So the point of a minimum effectiveness is that we want to see the like the breaking points between like not containing, not controlling the pandemic and the, a minimum that, that we have to do. So the effective uh effectiveness is partially depending on the like the intrinsic it's intrinsic to the uh to the test itself and partially depending on the compliance rate so we want to see how how overall how overall effectiveness uh, how, how overall it is uh has to be in terms of effectiveness to control the pandemic So is the, the point is to find the critical points. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I want to thank the speakers. I also want to make a couple announcements. Uh, this Friday, we have a special double feature seminar. We've never done this before. This Friday, we're also going to have a seminar at 2 p.m., uh, which is going to be more Student talks uh, this time is going to be about using rats to detect tuberculosis. So other sort of statistical uh, applied biological mathematics, very interesting. And on September 1st, so in two weeks, uh, we're going to have a special seminar dedicated to the future of seminar. So talking about what we want to do with seminar, uh, how we want to change things, what we want to, uh, when do we want to start up again, these kinds of questions. So. If you've been enjoying seminar all summer, we seminar all summer. We encourage you to come and check it out and uh, make your voice heard in the future of seminar. So, thank you very much for coming today. It's been a pleasure to have such wonderful undergrad speakers today uh, who did really impressive work on the SARS model. So, thank you very much. See you next week, folks. Or no, sorry. See you on Friday uh, if you want to come to our double feature. Be well, everyone. <laughs>